Hello and welcome to 2022 Data Protection Trends for Public Sector. Today's webinar is sponsored by Veeam and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Scott Becker. I'm from Actual Tech Media and I'm excited to be your moderator for this special event. Now, before we get to today's great content, we do have a few housekeeping items that will help you get the most out of this session. One is we want this to be an informative event for you, so we encourage any questions in the questions box in our webinar control panel. We won't have time for a live Q&A session at the end this time, but we will make sure that Veeam's experts get your questions so they can get back to you after the event. A Q&A panel is also the place to say hello and to let us know about any technical issues you might be experiencing. A browser refresh will fix most audio, video, or slide advancement issues, but if that doesn't work, just let us know in the Q&A and we'll provide further technical assistance. In the handout section of your webinar control panel, you'll find that we're offering several resources. The main one that I wanna call your attention to is the Get Started with Veeam link. <clears throat> you'll also find links to the Gorilla Guide Book Club where you can get access to actual tech media's great printed resources on technology topics, as well as a link to the ATM Event Center, which has our calendar of upcoming events. So I encourage you to access those resources now and share them with your friends and colleagues. At the end of this webinar event, we will be awarding a $300 Amazon gift card to one lucky registrant. Of course, you must be in attendance during a live event to qualify for the prize. The official terms and conditions of today's prize drawing can be found in the handout section. Scroll to the bottom and you'll find the prize terms and conditions link there. And with that, let's get to today's fantastic content. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter today, Jeff Reichert. He's Vice President for Public Sector and Compliance Strategy at Veeam. And now I'm gonna turn things over to Jeff. My name is Jeff Reichert. I work on the Product Strategy Team at Veeam in the Office of the CTO. And I spent a lot of my time talking with our large customers and with industry analysts about what's happening in the data protection market and what's happening with data protection trends. Today, I'm going to share with you some of Veeam's own research on this subject. Every year for the past three years, Veeam has conducted the largest ever survey done by anyone, including industry analyst firms, of where customers and organizations around the world are running their workloads, putting their data, what challenges they're running into with protecting their data, and what they see as the direction that they're going next. Goal for today is gonna to be more to talk with you about what your peers in state and local government and education are doing around data and data protection, and we'll also cover what's happening with budgets around data protection. Hopefully this should arm you with making some decisions uh, in your environment, given where, where the market is going and where your peers are going, and with thinking about what you wanna do around budget for data protection. So let's go ahead and dive in. The first question that we always ask when we run this survey is, where are your workloads actually running now? If we're doing a survey about data protection, it helps to know where folks have their critical enterprise applications running. This set of data is from the whole pool of respondents. It was uh, almost 3,400 respondents worldwide. The slide looks a little busy, but it's actually pretty straightforward. We have three years of historical data because we've run the survey for three years. And in each of these three groups of responses, that is, or your workloads on physical servers in the data center, uh, that's the group on the left, virtual machines in the data center, that's the group in the center, or on virtual machines, running up in the hyperscale cloud or in local managed service providers. That's the group on the right. The first three bars in each group are the answers for 2020, 2021, and 2022. Every year we also ask, what do you think the percentages will be in two years? And so we have the estimated numbers for 2023 and 2024 from this year's and last year's survey. And those are the gray bar uh, second from the right and the green bar on the right is the answer for 2024. So let's look at what we've seen. Well, if you look back to 2020, 38% of workloads in our respondents were still running on physical servers in the data center. You'll notice going to today, 2022, the middle bar, that answers down to 27%. And our respondents anticipate that it will be less than a quarter of the workloads by just next year. 
we saw a similar drop in virtual machines running inside data centers, going from 30% two years ago down to 25% this year, and probably stabilizing also at probably less than a quarter of the workloads, around 24% next year and in the following year. The obvious beneficiary of this trend has been workloads running up in the cloud. You'll notice that we are just under the middle bar, 49%, half of the workloads running in the public cloud this year. And we anticipate that that will be 52% by 2023 and 2024. I'll point out something else. It looks now, at least according to our respondents in the survey, like this trend is stabilizing a bit. You'll notice that last year the estimate was two, was 24% for physical servers, and this year that estimate held steady. Same thing for virtual machines, same thing for cloud-based workloads. So while we've seen a big transition from workloads running either physically or virtually in the data center downward over the past few years, it looks like to our respondents, the future is going to be a hybrid mix of workloads running either on-prem in physical servers, on-prem in virtual machines, or increasingly up in the public cloud. And that makes sense. There are different kinds of data with different classifications. Maybe if you're a state and local government, uh, you have public safety data that you're not comfortable putting in the cloud. Or maybe for reasons of data gravity, because you're collecting sensor data or camera data, you want to keep that on-prem. Uh, other workloads obviously make sense to go up in the cloud, and that's strongly the direction that the overall market has taken. So let's look and see how our respondents in the public sector compared with the overall pool. Just to be clear, we surveyed uh, almost 3,400 uh, organizations worldwide. These organizations were not surveyed directly by Veeam. We hired a research company to make sure that it was completely objective and the respondents didn't know that Veeam was the source of the, of the survey that was being used. Um, similarly, uh, we collected information about the different size organization and the uh, industry that the organization was in when we did the survey. And over 10% were either public sector or educational organizations. Most of the organizations surveyed were large. They were enterprise as industry analysts define that term. That is over a thousand folks working at the organization. Now, if you look at how public sector and education stacked up compared to the overall survey response pool, you'll notice that these groups were very, very similar to our respondents as a whole. In fact, even though sometimes folks think that government or educational institutions lag in technology, that actually is not the case. We have a higher percentage of, of these organizations that have gotten off of physical servers and have adopted virtual machines, and they are identical in terms of responding uh, that they have adopted the public cloud. You'll notice they're right at 49%, and they're also exactly in step with the larger trends for 24% uh, uh, of virtual machines and physical servers and 52% of cloud resources going forward. So. That's where the workloads are running. We are in a hybrid world and will be for the foreseeable future. We then ask every year our pool of respondents, okay, when things go wrong, what's the cause of that? What is the cause of outages that you've experienced in the past year? You'll notice the slide again, it looks a little busy, but I'll explain. First, we ask if you could choose every cause of outages. Tell us everything that went wrong in the past year. Uh, tell us that. And that is the long yellow bar on the top. So you'll notice that infrastructure and networking outages was the most common cause of outages. It had the most people saying yes out of the larger survey pool. But we then also ask, okay, if you could choose only one, and choose what was the worst outage, the one that had the most impact on your organization last year. Tell us that. And you'll notice we have that answer for 2020. That is when we asked last year, if you look back, what was the worst outage you had in 2020? When we asked this year, if you look back to 2021, what was the worst outage that you had? The 2020 answer is in the middle. The 2021 answer is at the bottom. These are organized by the most impactful outage, and you'll notice that cybersecurity events were the most impactful outage, followed closely by another human-caused kind of event, accidental deletion or corruption. Um, 
So those were the most impactful events. And of course, after that, we have the normal sets of things that you would expect, things breaking, the network breaking, server, storage, operating system, whatever the case may be. If you take a look, though, there is another couple of human causes of errors that come in at the bottom, um, and those are administrator config error or else uh, intentional bad things being done by an insider, you know, intentional admin or user disruption. It's important to note, taking a look at this, that while uh, a lot of kinds of resources that we have have gotten more reliable over the years, while storage, while servers, networks, operating systems have gotten more reliable, they're still not immune from things going wrong. And of course, human beings either accidentally or intentionally doing bad things is something that we're going to have to plan around for the foreseeable future. Let's see how these numbers compared with our state and local government and education respondents. When we ask these groups, not what the most impactful, but what the most common source of outages for them were. From state and local, it exactly matched the larger pool, infrastructure and networking outages. And from education, and also at the bottom for state and local, it was storage hardware outage. I'm going to pause here and point out that at Veeam, we have recommended for years something called the 321 rule, and we've recently expanded that, and I'll talk more about that later on today. But the 321 rule says that you should have three copies of your data, including the primary copy, and you should have it on two different kinds of storage. This answer for the most common causes of outages kind of points out why we advocate that rule. If you uh, don't have your data sitting on two different types of storage, if, for example, you're doing what some folks do and actually putting backups on the same uh, storage array that you've got your production data on, or if you're relying only on storage snapshots for protection, if you then have storage hardware outage, your backup method has been sidelined at the same time. So it's really important that you have an alternate backup storage medium so that if you have a production storage outage, and again, this is top five for both state and local and for education, that you can still recover your data. Digging through a little bit more, server hardware was second choice for both of these groups. And then accidental deletion or corruption or administrator configuration error also are top five. So again, we've got the human element coming in again. Outage of public cloud resources made it to top five for state and local government. And then we have cybersecurity or OS uh, outage coming in at fourth and fifth for education. On the public cloud and storage front and on the administrator configuration error, there was an outage and data loss that happened last year that illustrates these causes sort of all together very, very well. There was a large southwestern city that had transferred a lot of data, including public safety, thing like criminal prosecution data, up into the public cloud. They found that that resource was costing them more than they wanted. And when they tried copying that data back down to on-prem storage, because of human error, they accidentally deleted about 20 terabytes of that data. That was very impactful. They were in the sort of headlines about that. Um, but it points out that you always want to make sure that you've got redundancy in your system and that you've got your data sitting on more than one type of storage at a time so that you're not in a position where you're, you know, going to be going to be losing terabytes and terabytes of irreplaceable data. So that covers the bad things that can happen. We then ask respondents every year in this survey, OK, we know where you're running your data. We know the types of outages that you're having. How well would you estimate your organization is doing actually protecting that data? And unfortunately, every year, the answers are kind of dismal. If you're a backup admin, you'll recognize what these two statistics are capturing instantly. The top question is asking about recovery time objective. That is, how long does it take you to get back up and running after an outage? The bottom stat is capturing uh, recovery point objective. That is, if something goes wrong, if your systems go down, how much data might you lose when that takes place? And if you look, the top question is asking about recovery time objective. You, the IT admin, the backup admin, the IT director or uh, chief information officer, you know how your systems are being protected. 
Are you in a, in a situation where you're likely to be down for longer than the business or the mission needs you to be down? You know, are you going to not be providing education or not be providing citizen services for longer than your customers internally would like you to be? And if you look, if you add up the strongly agree and agree, 90% of respondents this year in the in the larger survey pool strongly agreed or agreed that they would be down for longer than the business or the mission needed them to be. Very similarly, 89% agreed or strongly agreed that they would lose more data than the business or the mission wanted them to lose or, or believe that they could tolerably lose. So we're in a situation right now where the folks who are close to the way that data is being protected um, are not terribly confident that it's being protected as often as it should be or that there's failover systems in place that would allow quick enough recovery if something actually went down. Let's compare how that broader pool compared to state and local government and education. And the answer is state and local government and education line up very closely with the responses from the broader pool of respondents. 94% of state and local government agreed that they would be down for longer than would be desirable. 90% of education organizations agreed that. And again, 93 and 90% also agreed or strongly agreed that they would lose more data than the organization needed them to. Now, if you think about this, every kind of application is generally getting more resilient. We have more resilient storage options now. We have more resilient server hardware operating systems. So what's the source of this discontent with how data is being protected? I think that the answer is that we've all grown accustomed to data always being available and to applications and services always being there for us. I know in my personal life, that's what I expect. If I go to an app on my phone and I want to do online banking or make a restaurant reservation or interact with any business that I'm working with, I expect those things to always be available. And of course, our customers have the same expectations of us, whether they're consuming education or they're consuming citizen services from the government. And that's borne out in another statistic that we ask about every year. We ask, OK, how much downtime is actually tolerable for your applications? And every year, what we find out is that the gap between so-called normal applications and high priority applications is getting smaller. If you look, the broader pool of respondents said that for a high priority application, on average, they could tolerate an hour and 10 minutes of downtime, or I'm sorry, 110 minutes of downtime. And for a normal application, they could tolerate 134 minutes of downtime. That is not a big delta between high priority and normal. The line is getting strongly blurred between what we consider mission critical apps and what we consider normal run of the mill applications. Another way to point out that stat, if you look in the box on the left, 56% of high priority applications are required to be back up in less than an hour. 49% of normal applications are required to be back up and running after an outage in less than an hour. And if you think about that, that is a that is a level of downtime tolerance that means I'm going to be doing things like clustering or replication of my workloads to ensure that I can meet that kind of requirement. OK, the uh, tolerance for downtime is even less, if you'll notice here, among state and local customers and education customers. Uh, 73 minutes high priority for state and local government, 93 minutes high priority requirement for education. That is more strict than the, the, the larger pool of respondents. And 132 minutes and 126 minutes of tolerance of downtime for normal applications. If you think about it, it makes sense. If you're providing citizen services, that could be health and safety, fire, uh, police, things like that. So those need to be back up and running quickly. And obviously, if we're providing educational services, you know, it, you, if you lose days of education for students, that's something that's got to be made up later on and, and that gets a lot of visibility. So there's very, very low tolerance for downtime. So all these stats so far have been a little bit distressing. We have work. We know where workload is. We know what's causing outages. We know that respondents generally don't think they're protecting data as much as they would like to be, even though their tolerance for downtime is getting much less than it used to be in the past. 
We then turn to a little bit different question and we ask, OK, given all of that, how do you think that the most reliable organizations, the largest organizations with the most stringent requirements, what are they doing to protect their data? What do their solutions look like and what's critical for them? In other words, we ask, what is enterprise backup in your mind? And you'll notice the top answer, uh, if we let people list all considerations, is uh, that it should support cloud hosted workloads, which is not really a surprise given where we've seen workloads are going. In this question, we also ask if you could pick only one, what's the most important? And you'll notice here, this is uh, not sorted by most important, it's sorted by all considerations. But the most important was also the ability to support cloud workloads. The next one is supporting enterprise applications, because as we saw, things are still running on prem. And the third answer down also reinforces the fact that we have workloads that are running on prem. We need to be able to support our Unix boxes. We need to be able to support the network attached storage that we rely on and our on prem virtualization platforms. Then we have a number of answers that refer to scalability, things like uh, running across multiple locations, scaling to thousands or tens of thousands of servers, or supporting large scale tape libraries or dedupe uh, appliances. And both of those relate obviously to the scale of data being backed up. We have to be able to support that as well. If we look at how state and local respondents and education respondents answered the question, interestingly, their top priorities were a little bit different than the larger pool. For both of these groups, reliability was king. And it makes sense given how much state and local government and educational organizations have been targeted, particularly by ransomware, over the past few years. These customers know that they need a solution that is going to be reliable, even if they get hit by something like a ransomware attack. The answers after that are also interesting. We get easy to manage across locations in the number two slot for both government and education customers. We get cloud workloads in the third and fourth slot respectively, because of course, as we saw earlier on, state and local government and education have also um, actively migrated workloads to the cloud. We get two scale answers coming in next, rounding out the, the top four out of five answers, one for scaling to different locations, one for scaling to dedupe appliances, and then support for enterprise applications comes in next. So where are we now? We know that workloads are hybrid and will be. We know that a combination of things breaking and human action causes most of our outages. And we know what these respondents are looking for in terms of fixing the problem that they're not protecting data as well as that they'd like to and that they have less tolerance for downtime. And that's these kinds of capabilities that we see here. We ask a slightly different but related question to round out the survey every year. And that is, OK, we know what your problems are. We know what you like in the idea of an enterprise solution. But if you are actually going to change the solution that you're using this year, what would drive you to actually change what you have deployed? The top two answers, if you notice, are just to get it to work better. We'd like better recovery point and recovery time SLAs, and we'd like more reliability and success of backups. That is closely followed by the next two answers, which both relate to cost. We'd like uh, to change from CapEx to OpEx model, or we would like to improve ROI or TCO of our solution. Cloud also comes in, you know, moving to a backing up to the cloud. Uh, we get cost coming in again with software or hardware costs. We get things like diversifying and using different data protection for different workloads or being able to use as a service and a, a number of other capability focused uh, responses that round out the mix. You'll notice in this, and again, we're looking at the whole response pool, so 3,393 answers. We are again sorted by what is the most important, and the most important is getting it to work better, right? 11% to 9% for recovery point or for reliability, going down to, to you know the other solutions that you see here. If we compare this to our 
respondents in state and local government and education. The answers are interesting. We have reliability at the absolute top, so it's actually pretty well aligned with the enterprise backup answer that we saw last time where reliability was top. And it aligns with the fact that that was the second most common answer in the larger response pool. Of course, we also have cost coming in for both of these groups. And again, that's pretty well in line with the larger response pool. Moving backups to the cloud, also in line with the larger response pool. So far, state and local government and education are very well aligned. We see out of the top five answers, three of the same answers coming in here. Improving recovery point comes in for state and local next and a cost related that is changing from OPEX to or from OPEX or CAPEX, operating expenses or capital expenses, rounds out the top four for education. And the next two are capability based, either enabling snapshots or replication for state and local government or having special purpose backup tools that exactly match the workloads that we're now running that can give us better protection capabilities for those workloads. Every year we ask this question and every year we can kind of reduce the answers to four broad categories. And this year is no exception and our state and local respondents are no exception. Those capability, those categories are cost as we've talked about. After that comes capability, whether we're getting specific tools, whether we're just generally improving our reliability or our recovery points. Then comes complexity, and that is in the return on investment and total cost of ownership category. If I have too many tools uh, that I need to run to back up my applications, then I have too many people that have to, to run them, and I don't get the return on investment and the low total cost of ownership that I want from my solution. And finally, Cloud always figures in for the past three years. So if we net it out, cost, capability, complexity, and cloud are the big categories that cause people to change the way that they're actually protecting their data these days. Now, I mentioned up front, in addition to looking at technical capabilities and at, at the kinds of problems that folks were running into, we were going to talk about budgets as well. And when we asked, the global pool of respondents, what they thought was going to be happening with their backup budget this year. We got good news in terms of people's ability to implement changes that would help them protect their data better. On average, across the global response pool, folks expect backup budgets to increase by 5.9%, and state and local government and education were exactly in step with this trend. So probably, You've moved workloads over the past couple of years, maybe to new locations. Maybe you're able to take advantage of some of the grants that have come out to help organizations improve their cybersecurity posture, you know, the federal uh, aid that's been released to help state and local governments and education with, with COVID response has a big cybersecurity component, and it has a big component of enabling organizations to support remote citizen services and remote education, which of course also implies that we have to protect that data when we move it to new platforms to do those things. So I hope that this has been interesting. Um, I hope that it's given you more information about what your peers in state and local uh, government and education are doing around data protection, about the challenges that they're facing, and about what they're expecting in terms of budget. Now, I mentioned at the top of the talk that Veeam also does this uh, research every year to help us guide the direction that we're taking with Veeam. And so we're going to talk a little bit about some changes that have come into the Veeam platform driven by what we're hearing from our customers and from the industry as a whole in our research. If you know Veeam well, you probably know us as the leading backup solution for VMware environments. Veeam celebrated our 15th birthday this year, and we have led for about 13 of those years in, in backing up VMware. But of course, that's not where our customers stopped, and that's not where our backup solutions have stopped either. We also support all of the other major on-prem hypervisors. That includes Hyper-V, it includes Nutanix AHV and Red Hat virtualization, and we do hypervisor-native uh, backups for all of the public cloud 
providers out there, including AWS, Azure, Google, the leading solutions. We also have the industry's leading solution for backing up Kubernetes-based container workloads, whether they are running up in the cloud or whether they are running on-prem in your data center. We support the leading software as a service applications. We actually have over 8 million licensed users backing up Microsoft 365 environments using Veeam Backup for Microsoft 365. And we will be releasing later this year Veeam Backup for Salesforce. And I know that a lot of our state and local customers use Salesforce for citizen services. And it's got a very, very popular platform for the same reason that private companies use it to reach out to their customers, state and local governments use it to provide citizen services. I will mention we've seen a huge adoption, especially in the past couple of years, of Microsoft 365 among state and local governments. And at last year's Veeam On Conference, I actually sat down in a panel with three city CIOs, the CIOs of Sarasota, Florida, Geneseo, Illinois, and Rancho Cucamonga, California. All of those were enthusiastic Microsoft 365 customers. They had rolled it out in a big way for remote work and remote citizen communication and, and for education. And all of them use Veeam Backup for Microsoft 365 because of their record retention requirements and their compliance mandates. If we expand the picture, as I mentioned up front, on-prem physical and virtual workloads have not gone away and they're not going away. And so we support enterprise applications like SAP and Oracle and Microsoft SQL that our customers are running on-prem. We also support uh, things like unstructured data in NAS and file shares, and we support the leading uh, workstation and server platforms for physical servers and workstations. And that includes Windows, Linux, Mac, and it includes Oracle, uh, Solaris, and AIX. So we talked a lot when we looked at what folks look at for uh, enterprise backup at cloud support, the ability to get data to and from the cloud, the ability to back up cloud native applications and standardize my protection for them. Veeam takes that very seriously, which is why Veeam's backup format is portable and allows you not just to back your data up into the cloud. And by the way, we expect Veeam customers this year to send over an exabyte of data up into the public cloud. In Q1 of this year, Veeam customers backed up over 240 petabytes of data into the public cloud. We don't just let you send the data up to the cloud, but we also let you restore workloads into the public cloud. And we let you do that from your main data center or from remote or branch offices. We saw before how important support for remote sites is for state and local and education customers. I'll also mention, and we haven't talked about this yet today, but Veeam also has a very active network of thousands of Veeam cloud and service providers. And our VCSP, Veeam cloud and service provider community, is also a very popular solution for state and local organizations or educational institutions that want to let a partner manage their backups for them. Now, our capabilities around cloud mobility also extend to pulling data out of the cloud. We talked about our customers that do that for Microsoft 365, but we also talked about the 321 rule and why it's important to get your data off-site, even if that production data is sitting up in the cloud. So we enable cloud mobility with our portable data format and our ability to do cross-platform restores. We also enable it, and we have for quite a while, in our license model. Veeam, when we began, uh, was licensed by Sockets, just like our customers were buying VMware and licensing that by Sockets. They licensed their protection solution by Sockets as well. But obviously, socket-based licensing doesn't make a lot of sense if I'm moving to EC2 instances or to virtual machines that are running in Azure or in Google Cloud. And so Veeam has transitioned to a license model, which is per workload, per instance. And what that means is that if I was on VMware or if I did have physical servers and I have moved those up into Azure and AWS, for example, the exact same licenses that I used previously to protect my on-prem physical and virtual machines can move right along with my workloads and now protect 
my virtualized machines that are running up in the cloud. There are a couple of uh, backup solutions that Veeam offers that have little asterisks beside them, and you'll note the point below. Obviously, it doesn't make sense to talk about instance-based protection of Salesforce or of Microsoft 365. For those workloads, we license our protection by user the same way that you license the solution itself. And for Kubernetes, we license the solution by nodes, which is also the way that you license Kubernetes-based solutions. But overall, what we do to meet the requirements for cloud mobility or let you easily move data, and including restoring cross-platform between on-prem and the cloud. And we made sure that we rolled out a friendly license model that's easy to understand and that supports that exact kind of data mobility too. I'm gonna to talk about one other area where Veeam has been responsive to what we hear from our customers. And that's of course, in the cybersecurity area. You'll notice that for state and local organizations and education, it was the most impactful cause of outages in 2021 and in 2020, just like other organizations. And it was actually a top five most frequent cause of outages for education. So I mentioned before the 32110 rule. Uh, we've supported the 321 rule at Veeam forever. The one and the zero that we've added onto that to make the data protection zip code are cybersecurity focused additions. I'll walk through the whole uh, rule now, uh, just to make sure that it's clear. We advocate that you have three copies of your data, one production copy and two backup copies, that those be on two different types of media, and I touched on that before, so not on the same storage array as your primary storage and out of the cloud if your primary application is running in the cloud, and that one be off-site, again, to protect against uh, cloud-wide outages or against physical disasters in your data center. The two numbers that follow, the, the, the one and the zero at the end, refer in the one that you should have one copy of your data that is either offline, immutable, or air-gapped. In other words, if a ransomware adversary is on the network, that it, it's not possible for them to delete the backups. And Veeam's own research shows that in over 90% of ransomware attacks, the adversary did attempt to delete backups when they attacked. It's extremely common now, it's the norm, that if an adversary attacks you with ransomware, they will try to seek out and delete your backups. So you need to be resilient against that. And the zero uh, is about ensuring that your backups are actually fit for purpose, that you have zero errors, and that you restore zero malware back into your environment when you're recovering from an outage. Now, we're not going to talk about that last zero today because time doesn't permit, but I am going to dig a little bit more into both immutability and into innovations that Veeam has done to help organizations overcome the uh, reality gap that we talked about in terms of data protection. And those innovations are around our integrations with primary on-prem storage solutions. You, we've seen already that roughly half of the workloads that folks have, they anticipate staying in physical or virtualized uh, data center machines. And so it's important that we integrate closely with the storage platforms that your virtualization solution or your physical servers are using in the background. Back in 2017, Veeam uh, invented something called the Universal Storage API that connects to Veeam capability. We had a number of large storage integrations before that, but you'll notice that the number of integrations has really taken off since then. This makes it easy for our alliance partners who have leading uh, hardware platforms for storage to make sure that Veeam can control snapshots on their platform and replication on their platform. In other words, it lets Veeam be the dashboard that can control very frequent storage snapshots that let you protect your data more frequently and get away from that bottom bar that we saw in the reality gap where our organization is going to lose more data than the business would like it to. And it also lets us not affect the uh, performance of our production workloads, because obviously if we can integrate with storage snapshots, then we don't need to do things like uh, keep VSS snapshots open on Windows for longer or keep VMware snapshots open for longer on that platform. So in terms of performance and reliability, it's been a big win for our customers. It's also a win, by the way, based on our integrations with 
the immutability options in primary storage platforms. Increasingly, our hardware partners have the ability to take snapshots that are protected from ransomware, and Veeam can orchestrate those just like we can other snapshots that are in place. So it's also a good solution for ransomware. If we look at what the entire environment looks like in terms of uh, Veeam data protection, we typically talk in terms of something called the scale-out backup repository or SOBER. That is just a Veeam construct. It is a virtualized pool of backup storage that includes three tiers. The performance tier is the initial landing zone of data. That can be direct attached storage. It can be NAS. It can be the dedupe appliance of your choice. And we support a number of vendors, uh, deduplication appliances, many of which, like Data Domain with their retention lock capability listed here, support immutability features. So you can be protected from ransomware in those platforms. And we have our own immutable hardened repository, which is based on commodity Linux server and storage hardware. It is actually a good ransomware solution, and it is a very inexpensive and high-performing solution for backup storage as well. Beyond that, you can send data out to object storage, and that can be either on-premises in with partners of Veeam like Cloudian or Minio or Scality, or it can be up in the public cloud with partners of ours like AWS and Azure, for example, or with other S3 compatible storage solutions like those from uh, Seagate's Live Cloud or from Wasabi. And finally, we support ultra low cost for long-term retention archive tiers of storage with things like the, the long-term retention low cost uh, versions of blob storage from AWS and from Azure. The good news for recovering from ransomware and again, we mentioned immutability earlier, is that all of these solutions support immutability from start to finish. I mentioned before that you can get that through integrations that we have with storage partners. It is also a core component of our immutable hardened repository, which came out as part of Veeam version 11. And there are multiple blob storage, object storage platforms that also support immutability. What's interesting is that the, the immutability support with things like S3 object lock in compliance mode on Amazon were invented for a completely different use case than ransomware. They were invented so that organizations that are regulated, that have to be able to submit results like financial returns, and then the regulators have to be sure that they can't be changed. They need a solution that once it's audited, once it's submitted, it can't be changed so that a company can't go back and cook the books after they've submitted their financial returns. That's the use case that object lock and compliance mode was come up for. Even the vendor, in this case, for example, Amazon, and even an administrator with admin credentials at the customer can't go back and change it. If you set a seven year retention period for that data, it is going to be saved for seven years period and can't be uh, deleted or, or changed. It turns out that that's a perfect use case for recovering from ransomware, because we have to assume that if an adversary has been on our network for a period of weeks or months, they have compromised some admin credentials. And as I mentioned before, 90% plus of the time, they're going to try to lead backups as part of their attack. So you need an ultra resilient storage solution that can resist that even from an adversary who has compromised admin credentials. And fortunately for our customers, Veeam is a software only solution that enables that level of data protection. Uh, so we listen when we read that cybersecurity incidents are a leading and impactful cause of outages for our customers. And we give you a lot of choices about how you meet that requirement in your environment. Now, if you have not worked with Veeam before, I will just mention that Veeam recognized years ago that if you're in the backup business, you're also in the security business. We as an organization are ISO 27001 compliant ourselves. Solutions like our immutable hardened repository have been audited. I mentioned before the write once, read many requirement, and we have been independently audited uh, by another uh, uh, compliance firm to make sure that if you configure the hardened Linux repository, According to Veeam directions, it is a valid ransomware proof write once read many solution. 
And Veeam internally has adopted the NIST cybersecurity framework. And as I mentioned before, we're ISO 27001 compliant. So we take security very seriously internally as an organization. We also tend to do pretty well with evaluations from industry analysts. Uh, Veeam has been in the leaders quadrant of the Gartner Magic Quadrant for the past six years. We have been at the top in terms of ability to execute for the past two of those years. So when Gartner goes out and asks our customers, can Veeam really follow through on their promises? Can they, can they walk the walk and not just talk the talk? The answer is overwhelmingly yes. That is also reflected in the fact that we typically win uh, Users' Choice Awards when industry analysts go out and ask Veeam customers if they're happy with their solution. The answer tends overwhelmingly to be yes. That's also reflected in our market share numbers. Veeam has been growing revenue at double digits for the last 13 quarters. For the last three years plus, we have outgrown every other organization that makes enterprise backup software, according to IDC market share numbers. I'm not mentioning the market share numbers to, to pat Veeam on the back, but it's important when you choose a data protection partner that you choose somebody who's going to be around for the long haul, that's going to be there for you and not go away, be acquired, go out of business, um, and leave you in the lurch. Veeam is a profitable, stable, secure company. We are going to be around for the long haul, and we're a good partner for you for protecting your data. If you would like to know more about the research that we've been talking about today, we have an executive brief covering data protection trends in this year's report for the public sector specifically. So please take a look at that. I urge you to, to check that out. It's at the URL below. If you would like to know more about Veeam in general, take a look at Veeam on 2022. It's right around the corner coming up May 16th through 19th, and it is going to be both live in Las Vegas and virtual. We are going to have deep dives on all of the subjects that we talked about today, more on the Data Protection Trends Report, but a lot more on Veeam technology, including how we help keep our customers safe from ransomware and from the other kinds of disasters that, as we saw earlier, can befall your data. So please check it out. Uh, the virtual online event is free. It is always a good time, and uh, I hope that we'll see you there. Thanks very much for your time today. Really appreciate it. And again, if you'd like to know more about data protection trends, the URL is at the bottom of the slide. Take care. Okay, thanks, Jeff, for a great presentation. And just a reminder that in addition to the link that uh, Jeff shared, if you follow the link in your handout section for getting started with Veeam, there's a link on that page to download the 2022 data protection trends report that Jeff re referred to throughout his, his session today. Um, that page also has other information about free trials and info about the, the upcoming Veeam on conference. So be sure to check that out before the session ends here in a minute. And uh, as we do wrap up, we have one more piece of business. It's the $300 Amazon gift card prize drawing. And the winner of that $300 Amazon gift card today is Atanas Denev from California. So congratulations to Atanas. We'll be in touch to get you your card. And with that, on behalf of the actual tech media team, I want to thank Veeam for making this event possible. And thanks, as always, for attending and for your great questions. That concludes today's event. Have a great rest of your day, and we will see you next time.